Hello, welcome to Real Film Snobs. I'm Brian Michael. And I'm Angela Yeager. We have a special episode for you this week. This is our best films of 2017 episode. Every year we count down our top 10 films from the previous year. This time we're doing a little bit earlier. We're in February, not in March like we usually are. We wait for some of the films to trickle down to Salem. And Brian and I have been cramming our heads. A lot, a lot of movies the last few movies. weeks in particular. I think my record yep. was eight in one week. So here, so here we go. We'll just dig right Jump in, right in, in Let's go with, with number my 10. number 10. And my number 10 film is uh, one of the favorites to win some Oscars this year, The Shape of Water by Guillermo del Toro, Ooh. which uh, I know was not one of Brian's favorites, but um, it's up there with Pan's Labyrinth, probably a little bit below that in my opinion, but uh, as a great dark fantasy fable, um, it's a film that is filled with gorgeous imagery, um, pitch perfect performances from Sally Hawkins, Michael Shannon, uh, Richard Jenkins, um, and it just uh, was a film that really captured my imagination. It was a film that I don't feel we had a lot of good fantasy in the last few years. In general, you know, it's hard to make a good fantasy film that isn't over beleaguered with too much special effects and where it really focuses on the characters and the story. And this Sexy one. Merman. And sexy merman. Well, I'm not sure if he was quitted. He was more like an Aquaman of some sort. I'm not sure, but yeah. And even though Sally Hawkins, really, in terms of her strongest performance in 2017, was for Maudie, I think, yeah. in terms of just the performance. If she wins it, it will be for this one. But I don't think she's probably going to win the Oscar, unfortunately, um, because she's just one of the great character actors over the years who's just turned in one masterful performance after another. And I so. enjoyed the movie. I just didn't give it four stars. So it was not my. It top... failed in the second yeah. act for you. Yeah, I yeah. Think. It necessarily yeah. didn't. Yeah. I thought Octavia. Spencer could have played that role just as well. Okay, so my number ten is I've got two big Hollywood, two big Hollywood movies on mine. I got two big Hollywood movies on mine, and this my number ten is War of the Planet of the Apes. And I think that Matt Reeves, who's going to be directing the new Batman movie, of course, uh, deserves a lot of credit for the last two uh, ape movies in this trilogy that I really actually enjoyed. And it's kind of sad that they've kind of went under the radar, uh, certainly with their uh, the special effects being nominated, sure, uh, but the performances, certainly Andy Serkis, who's one of the best things in Black Panther, by the way, and also in, in this movie as well, along with Woody Harrelson, who we'll be mentioning a little bit later in, on my list. Um, but uh, yeah, I love the fact that they're able to balance. This is a big budget movie. You actually get to see all of the budget right there on screen. There are so many big budget movies this last year that looked terrible, Justice League, that were poorly written, Justice League, and uh, and it just didn't do anything for me, Wonder Woman. And uh, so to be able to see these characters you actually really cared about, they actually did a really great job of pulling Nova, the Nova character from the original, um, paying tribute to the past films, as well as you know, kind of looking forward to the to the future. But um, a nice wrap up in it. I really enjoyed it and I just had to fit it fit in here somewhere along the line and from the director mm -hmm. again Matt Reeves who did um, also Let Me In and Cloverfield kind of an interesting career that he's, he's oh that is together. interesting yeah, yeah no yeah. and I enjoyed that trilogy as well I didn't give it four stars but I would say all three films were really solid yeah. and that's pretty it's unusual for trilogy. any trilogy and I would say the other thing about the Planet of the Apes movies is that I think they've managed to improve it's been a, one of the few reboots where it's really improved on the original ones particularly much better than the horrible Tim uh, Burton version but yeah I think that over that didn't happen. But, you know, it's it's managed to improve upon its source material, I think. So good good pick. Um, so my number nine film is a foreign language film that's uh, nominated for an Oscar um, and was quite the uh, controversial pick for the Palme d'Or this year at the Cannes Film Festival. And it's The Square by Ruben Ostlin. This is a very divisive film. About half the critics that I follow on social media, film critics um, internationally, hated this movie. And uh, there were the, uh, those of us, myself, amongst them who really loved it. And it's, it's a very device really the movie. It's a three-hour satire. Uh, it's a send-up of the art world. It's also a send-up of modern, you know, social media marketing and PR. It's a look at class examination and immigration immigration issues in Europe. I mean, it's got it's sort of got everything in the kitchen sink thrown in, and the fact that it works so well is pretty masterful. It's also very funny and very smart movie, um, but it has a lot going on. And I think um, the comparisons some of the critics I follow that hated it said, "Oh, it was too Kubrick-esque." I don't know when becoming like Kubrick became a bad thing um, but um, but Ruben Austin uh, previously directed a film called Force Majeure which I also thought was just fascinating and it was also a movie that was very much more about ideas so this is not my usual type of movie because you know me I tend to go for more character pieces I tend to like movies that are very rich in characters and this movie isn't really about the characters it's really much more about the ideas but for me it just worked 
And with two and a half hours, three, yeah, it's yeah. Long. It's it was long. like I had options to see other films with my schedule. I, I know. chose to skip and this I had one. A lot of, I don't remember you giving it four though. I did I give it four, sworn. and I but I, you know, as we talked about, uh, we both had more than four star, you know, more than ten four star films. So yeah. I forgot to mention this that we will have the runners up on our website. Sure. So because there were a lot of films that could have easily been in my number eight, nine, ten slot. Oh, yeah. So some of them I picked because I wanted to highlight certain yeah. movies. Uh, so my number, we'll move on to my number nine, uh, which is a Trey Edward Schultz, uh, who directed Cresha, uh, directed, uh, it comes at night. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what I'm really enjoying right now is these small, you know, we're talking for a smaller budget film that, uh, work really well on ambiance and creating tension and creating what is out there in the dark. Now, this is a very divisive film because the marketing for it was, it's a horror film, it's a horror film. Well, we never actually really get to see what's out there, which I really enjoyed because I think your imagination is always is 10 times more scary than what actually they can put together in, in, in uh, special effects or blue looking special effects at night. Uh, again, this star stars Joel Edgerton, who's becoming one of my favorite actors because mm -hmm. when I see him in sc on screen, I go, I want to see this movie. There's a new Jennifer Lawrence film. I'm like, I don't know if I really want to see that movie, but because he's in it, I'll go and see it because I really enjoy mm -hmm. the choices that he's making throughout his career. And he's, he keeps popping up in my top 10 list with like a movie like The Warrior um, where he didn't get the big meaty role, um, but in this one, um, you know, this is whole family that's just kind of shut in um, they're scared about who they're bringing in and in some films a small or bigger films they might just have a little bit of tension on who these people are and leave it at that the whole film is about not trusting and what's going on right. and when that point when the fear of the other happens. yeah and the ending to me is one that just absolutely stuck with me i saw that movie the same night as i saw the mummy which would be one of the worst films of the year and it haunted me all the way through that still watching tom cruise run around from a special effect i kept thinking about this little budget movie where it was something was in the dark out in the night that was just terrifying, mm. and I absolutely loved that. And I know you liked this one quite a bit more than I did. Um, I liked it, but I think I was a little disappointed, partially because you had built it up so much. I think I was like ready for this big emotional punch. And, well, that's and my I was, fault. Well, and I just thought it was okay. <laughs> which is what I think you're going to say about my next one, which is my number eight film, which is a Romanian drama that we reviewed just recently on the show called Graduation oh. by Christian Mingu. Um, and this, uh, gosh, this is about a parent who will do anything for their kid. Um, but what's interesting about this movie movie, unlike the type of story where we typically see that where the parent has to bend all the rules and break the rules to do something, you know, and go outside of the norm for their kid. In this case, you have a system, uh, a corrupt system, government and otherwise, that's entirely complicit in rule breaking. And so, um, and how these kinds of issues of morality are passed on to our children. This is the director who won the Palme d'Or years ago for four months, three weeks and two days. And I just, mm -hmm. this film really stayed with me. You know, the more I thought about it, you know, we saw some films after this, um, the movie, the documentary, Icarus about some of the, the doping you know, controversies in Russia and, and places like that. And, um, and it made me think about this whole issue of these, you know, morality and how certain things become almost like passed on from generation yeah. to generation about what's right and what's wrong. And, and it, I don't know, it's a very simple little movie in some ways, but it's one that really stuck with me. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know necessarily simple because I, there was an well, awful not, lot going on about in that movie. On, and I, yeah. Not in a bad way. I really did enjoy the movie, not as much as you did. But yeah, there was an awful lot in that film and I really enjoyed that. Was that streaming? Is that was available? So yeah, yeah, it is available that, on which streaming. Is really yeah, nice to and it's see. really yeah, and it yeah, I didn't mean simple. There is a lot going on in terms of that. I meant simple in terms of there's not great special effects or yeah. huge visual sweeping visuals or anything. So okay, so my number eight was the big surprise of the year. Uh, this Jordan Peele's Get Out, uh, which was billed again as a horror film, a social commentary, a comedy. It's it's all kinds of things, and I know we like to shove things into a genre. It's just a great, amazing film, and I've seen it a number of times, and each time. I've seen it it just gets better and it just gets better and um, what's really amazing about this film is that when you watch it over again like the opening scene where they have where they're both pulled over by the police it's the it's the white girlfriend with her black boyfriend and uh, the police officer officer automatically wants to see both their licenses and she's like why do you want to see his license he wasn't driving and she speaks up and he's like no no don't don't make a scene it's okay it's okay and she's like no and that's certainly the white privilege that certainly comes with that he's right. used to that type of thing but she's also not wanting to have a record of him being being there because what's going to be happening later in the film that's the how smart and how layered and so how many you know everything that happens in this film happens for a reason and it uh, you know interacts later on mm -hmm. or it pulls up later on and that's 
brilliant writing. I, I mean, it's just so this film, good. I know it's a long shot to win Best Picture, but I, gosh, I hope it gets something for writing because the script yeah. is just one of the most brilliant scripts I've seen, we've seen in a long time. And, the, yeah. you know, in terms of being a horror film as, as a, you know, uh, as a middle-aged white male, there are some scenes at the dinner party that I just wanted to crawl under the seats and hide and plug my ears to the things that were being said, especially to him, that were yeah. just uh, terrifying. It's a great, um, an great amazing film. amazing film on every level. Yes, and I will be talking about that. It really should that. be higher on my list. I, I know, I was level. like, and it Dang, will be higher right? on mine, so Dang. I will be talking about that a little bit later. <laughs> um, so my number seven film is uh, Columbus. Um, now this is a, uh, just, I thought, actually this was my favorite coming of age story, I suppose. I don't know. No, that's not true. I have another one later on. I love coming of age stories. Yes, um, but Columbus was a real surprise. You know, I went into this as a first time filmmaker, which I actually have several on my list this year, which I just by coincidence that are first time filmmakers. John Cho finally becomes the matinee idol we all knew yeah. was there after years of, you know, being Harold and Kumar or being Sulu on Star Trek. He finally gets yeah. a leading man role and he's, you know, a handsome, he's a good looking guy who's also a terrific actor. He deserves to get these kind of roles. And he's so. an intelligent man and plays it extremely well. Not that that's surprising. Right. And a romantic nice lead. See, yes. Yeah, nice to see, a, you know, an intelligent part in a film and him to get that and just run with it. It was great. I know. And it's got beautiful scenery. It's set and it's not named for Christopher Columbus as I thought, because that's how little I knew about this film before I went uh. in. Um, it's about the town of Columbus, Indiana, which is known for its modern architecture. And he develops a relationship with a local girl played by Haley Lou Richardson. Uh, most people might know her from the movie Edge of Seventeen. And she's really torn between, you know, staying in town and staying with her mother, who's got issues, um, or going on to pursue her dreams of becoming an architect. And then it also has a wonderful, wonderful supporting role with Parker Posey, who I really wish had somehow been able to be squeezed in for a support actress nomination because I just she's, she's so good in this movie and a small role but makes huge impact I just loved it yeah so. that's actually available on streaming and I was able to, to knock that out and oh, watch really? it's okay. a, yeah it's a beautiful looking film as well uh, speaking of what you know now that I see that my films that are ahead of get out I'm like yeah where did I squeeze that in so number seven I have call me by your name uh, Scott mm -hmm. Hosner came onto the show or Sundance uh, um, uh, Correspondent. Correspondent. There you go. Came onto the show and immediately talked about this film. And uh, so there was a high, high anticipation. And as about halfway through this movie, I went, it's good. Um, guys, let's, is something going to happen here or whichever? This is probably about as close as I'll ever get to reading a novel. Uh, there's so much ambiance. There's so much setting. I really felt like I spent the summer in the 80s in, in Italy after watching this film. And not a bad place to be. It's not a bad thing. <laughs> And it just took its time and unraveled things beautifully. There's a relationship between two men that have conversations before, they have conversations during, and they have adult conversations after that I really, truly appreciated. There's a great credit scenes, yes, yes, yes. But I really appreciated the conversations that we're having because these were two, both, both of these were both mature adults, which I know is a little bit of a controversy. I'm going to bumble his name, Timothy. Chalamet. Chalamet, I thought gave the best um, acting performance uh, for male lead uh, of the year. I really hope he wins uh, um, the Oscar. I don't think he will, but I really thought he was able to juggle a lot. Um, Talk about whether his film. age or not. I, I thought yeah. he was a fantastic actor. And then, the, of course, the director who had also done a beautiful love story with I Am Love a few years back. Gorgeous. That, we just, which was kind of the same feeling. It was just like I just felt like I was kind of there. It was warm. I feel the sun on my face, the wind in my ears and uh yeah just an absolutely Gorgeous, beautiful yeah. wonderful film so happy be, to have it here and i will be talking about it just in a few minutes oh, so just num get to it number six uh my number six film is dina and this is a documentary that was a real discover for me literally never opened i don't even know if it opened in oregon um it's interesting it got so little release because it actually won the grand jury prize at sundance um for best documentary it is a documentary but it's also a romantic comedy and you know in a dark year with a lot of dark films and a lot of dark things going on in the world this is a film that makes you feel good about being human it makes you feel good about being alive and that is not something i see in very many movies it is about a, a woman um, um, who is kind of a force of nature. Uh, she has, um, uh, she's suff uh, it's not suffered, she is on the autism spectrum and she finds love. And it's about her journey, discovering love with her partner and kind of juggling that. And then she's got some demons in her closet in terms of things that have happened to her in her past. And it gets in that. It's also first time filmmakers. So I just feel, and I was amazed at how this film just captured my heart. I was kind of teared up by the end and it was very romantic and very funny. And they don't make good romantic comedies anymore. And this was one of them. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, I, this sits on my queue, and I kept staring at it, and it was like, Walmart greeter, and I went, oh, yeah. 
Angela really likes it. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. Yeah, it's, it's still one I really recommend people check out. And it is a very short film. It's only like 70-something minutes. I know. So. I was like, mm. I know. Okay. Okay, so my number six, uh, you know, Angela deals with coming of age. I deal with grieving films. And uh, my number six was a huge surprise. I never thought in a million years I would have a ghost story on my top ten. Oh, wow. I saw the previews for it and thought, huh, interesting. So it's, case, it's a Casey Affleck with a sheet over his head, like uh, the, the Peanuts with his eyes cut out, just kind of wandering around. And that is literally the movie. And it is absolutely amazing and powerful and wonderful. It's David Lowry who directed Pete's Dragon and Ain't Them Body Saints. It shows that, uh, you know, with a small, tiny budget, you can actually do what you want to do when you have an Academy Award winning uh, uh, cast and uh, or nominated cast as well. But uh, it was just, I was amazed by how stunning this was. Mm -hmm. There were so many different scenes that when the, the ghost across the street, something happens to that one, uh, my, broke my heart. I was just so amazed how with how the quiet and the intensity of this film and how it just built. Again, a small independent film, just knowing yeah. how to build that tension, creating its world and just going with it. And I was just, wow. And I'm you didn't mention Rooney Mara. And I'm wondering, because no, you do. haven't always liked her, but did no. you like her in this movie? No, I couldn't wait for her. She wasn't in the movie much, so she's fine. She's she was in okay. quite a bit. She had the big pie yeah. eating scene. Yeah, the big pie eating scene. She ate a pie. An actress ate a pie. Oh, my God. A whole pie. Well, she was that grieving. is big news. She's well. She's sort of the yeah. one you see the most in the mm -hmm. movie, but yeah. Sure. Um, no, I really enjoyed it. And almost, yeah. it, it, I really enjoyed that movie. It did not quite make my top ten though. Um, so now my number five film is Call Me by Your Name um, by there Luca Guadagnino. And, and one thing I wanted to mention about Timothy Chalamet's performance is that there, are, sometimes as a film snob, you watch and all of a sudden you see an actor arrive. You know, you see a director bring an actor in and give him a scene yeah. that is magnificent, and you see just all of a sudden you realize, oh, a star is born so to speak you know um, and this is with Timothy Chalamet in this film I don't it's not his first film but boy does he just arrive and you're just like wow yeah. there is a major talent here I mean is an army hammer and Michael Stolberg they're all fantastic in the yeah. movie as well so it's really hard to do the director has mentioned that Bertolucci is one of his biggest influences and boy you can you see can it in all the right that. ways because yeah. this is a man who loves gorgeous people and gorgeous scenery and hey there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> I could totally be transported back into the world of this film and that is no problem by me so gorgeous film okay my number five is the other big huge hollywood blockbuster this was only a hundred million dollar film but christopher nolan's dunkirk actually did a great job with all of the special effects and an amazing story this is a technical achievement some people say that a lot of the actors are unknown tom hardy really um, but uh, sure, that's fine. I actually was captivated the by the way. mask over his face yet again. Yet again, that's fine. But I, I was captivated by the way the story was uh, the, the story was told and unfolded, and in different times, uh, in, in different sections. And I thought that was really smart, and I can't wait to see it again now that knowing what I, what I had seen the first time. But this is just another film that. You know, you want to understand about sound design because this one loves it. Uh, you want to show, you know, how special effects are done, how storytelling is done, and how words can are not necessarily needed in a story. I really enjoyed. This is a technical marvel, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's a big budget film. It's a big, huge hit. Thank goodness compared to the other big budgeted films that were this last year. I will give it that, yeah. And I really enjoyed that. And here's somebody that says, you know, here, I can make these big, huge movies. I want to make a movie about Dunkirk. And before this year, none of us really knew what the heck Dunkirk was. Now we had three movies this year that I talked about it. And I really appreciated that. We really actually got to learn something. In the, in the summer, we learned something. And then we got to see a big budget movie that wasn't stupid. Well, I do appreciate it for yes. that. If I had between this and another Transformers movie, I would take Dunkirk. Oh, good day. lord! I would say though that Dunkirk and Darkest Hour, though, are my two, my least favorite of the Oscar Best Picture nominees. Thanks, Thanks for taking the stab at my part. Go ahead. What's on your number? Go ahead. Just saying. <laughs> can't be nice. Well, what am I gonna do? I can't. It was, it's not one of my favorite movies. You don't have to okay. say that. Okay. Now my number four film is God's Own Country. Another. This is a little film that we went to see together, and I yeah. didn't again didn't know anything about it going in, and boy, it was and it you know and uh, it was just another really great romance actually this year. It was a good year for romances, and it's about a farmer um, who's got all these issues. He's an alcoholic. He's miserable. He's lonely, um, and he you know falls for this Romanian immigrant who comes to work on his the farmland, and it kind of brings up all these issues for him, and it's just a beautiful for another first-time filmmaker. I mean, this yeah. was a year for first-time filmmakers. So I'm like, wow, you can make this movie. It looks great. You have great performances. I mean, just yeah. every actor is fantastic and feels real and lived in and perfect. And um, I really liked this movie a lot. And I and it, there, it, to me, everything was perfect, including the ending. So we'll vote on my number four. 
which is uh, a killing of a sacred deer. Oh, I'm going to butcher Yargos's last name, Lanthimos, who also directed the, the Lobster. And again, if you had seen the Lobster, you understand the weird, uh, I'd say weird, the unusual uh, timing and, um, <laughs> and tone that, it's been, that they used in, in terms of their conversation. This film is the exact same thing, so it took me just a second to get right into it, find that rhythm, in, and really enjoy this film. Now, this is one that really surprised me in terms of the ending, because you've seen this type of setup before in movies where there's someone's making an ultimatum or someone's making a threat and they find a way out of it. This one necessarily doesn't and it makes a choice that I thought going through the movie like, you know, this movie is just odd enough. Wouldn't it be interesting if it did this? And it did. Um, and I gave it major points for that. It was like, oh my gosh, wow, we're really going to see this. And then it was like looking at a car wreck. She's like, oh, what's the car wreck? And then you see it and you're like, oh my God, that's ter this is terrifying. It's actually going to go there. And now. it just hurt. And the people I know that have seen this, you know, you make a little gesture where you turn in a circle and people just go, ha, ha, oh. And it was just so, so amazing. And it's such a brave film. And I really enjoyed that. Um, Colin Farrell, a fantastic performance. Nicole Kidman uh, was absolutely amazing in it. This weirdest love scene I've seen in a movie in a long time, in a really long time. And Is I hope not to top scene? that in a long time for a while. But um, definitely a film to, to try and find. Killing Especially if you deer. like more. Awesome idiosyncratic film, shall we wow, say. Yeah. yes. Okay, so I'll move on to uh, my number three film, um, which is a movie that just absolutely delighted me and took me by surprise, Lost in Paris, um, by the filmmaking mm. team Abel and Gordon is what they go by. They're a real-life um, couple. And I, this film was so good, in fact, that it for, I went into Netflix and found out that they have a bunch of films that they've done in uh, France mm. and Belgium before this one. This was the first one that hit my radar. And I rented, I put a bunch of them on my queue. I haven't got to all of them yet, but the one that I've watched so far was also very, very, very funny. I saw this in a full theater and everyone was just laughing and it was a day where I really needed a laugh. Um, it's a love story. It's got originality. It's wry. It's got this really wry humor too. A lot of people brought up Jacques Tati and Chaplin yes. and yes there's elements of that but yes. it's not only that. It has its own sure. flavor too. And she, her in particular, Fiona Gordon who stars in the movie, I thought she just has this really interesting face. She's not a conventional beauty by any stretch of the imagination no. but she's got a physicality and an interest. She's just interesting. Yeah, I just really wanted to keep watching these people so I loved this movie that's, so that's the why worst it's my thing in the world to be compared to Tati and Chaplin it's okay I'm like hey if I'm lost in that that's fine well, I don't want that's, people to just think it's a knockoff okay. though because I hey, felt like there were elements even then if it does it well who cares well that's they true they made a wonderful film and I know how much you enjoyed that one now my number three, now we'll get to it, is, is uh, God's Own Country Yay. that Angela I just talked about a little bit ago. Yeah, this one was, they were like, it's the Irish Brokeback Mountain. So of course everyone expects me to go and see this. Um, gay love themes uh, films have never, I, I really am not a big fan of the genre because gay films tended to be about two or three of the same thing, coming out, dying of AIDS and coming out and dying of AIDS. I usually what it's usually about. And um, this one has neither of this those one things. has neither of those things. <laughs> They're early and, out. <laughs> you know, that was again with this one, and I really, you know, I'm not the dumbest person in the world, but I really do enjoy learning something when I watch a movie. And I'm you not a about sheep farm farmer. Life. I am not a sheep farmer. I have no want really to be bright. a sheep farmer. But when they doing this, there was a couple different things that they did in this film, certainly with this with the with the lamb, you know yeah. what I'm talking yes, about. Yes, yes, yes. Was awesome because everyone's like, what is going on? Ooh, gross, gross, gross. And then you're like, oh, that is the most sweet and endearing. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. And then one of them, he about. looks yeah. at the other guy, this immigrant that he's, you know, that, that, that did this, and he looks at him. And you can tell, oh yeah, this the, you're falling in love with this guy because it's just absolutely wonderful. Well, and the cool thing about him is that they have something in common. It's based yeah. on their work ethic, you know, and they're both farmers. You know, they yeah. both. He came from Romania and he did different kind of farming, but he's able to teach him some things too. When he talks about why aren't you using the sheep milk, and they're like in England, like why would we do with that? He's like, uh, you make delicious European cheeses. You know, yeah. you can make these cheeses. People will pay good money for these cheeses. You no, know, so it was really it didn't cool. Get, you know. It kind of came and went here, but it did get a BAFTA nomination for Best Film oh, of the Year. Good. So I was so really happy, happy to that. see that it got some recognition, at least in its home t in its home oh, country. It's a but it's a film. beautiful, beautiful film. It's available out there. you got to go out and find it. You really won't be disappointed. It's a beautiful love story. Yes. And I, rarely do I get to say that. Yes. It's very, very good. A satisfying ending, which, you know, you don't get a lot of either. So my number two film is the one you should have had higher on your list, uh, which is Get Out Get by out Jordan out. Peele. Um, and I have to mention some of the performances in this film because I wanted to touch on some because you already touched on some great aspects of the writing. And I would say the screenplay is airtight. I mean, if you want to study screenwriting, my God, the screenplay is amazing. But there's also it's also bolstered by some great performances. Catherine Keener as the mother, uh, uh, Brad V. Woodford as the father, yeah. Daniel Kaluuya in a star making. 
role as the lead. Um, Even the comedian, Little Rel Hen... uh, Oh, boy, I'm going to butcher his last name, as Rod. And he's the comedic sidekick (laughs) in a way, but he's very good and very funny. and really great commentary on what is happening. Right. And it's also a stereotype. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's really well done. And the actress you mentioned, you were the one that mentioned her uh, first. And then I've seen several people that since then mentioning that Betty Gabriel, who plays Georgina, should have been nominated. And she plays the, quote-unquote, maid. Um, And those who've seen the film will know why I'm saying quote-unquote. Yes, for one scene. If someone was ever to win an award for one scene, her scene should have been it. So it's also bolstered by great performances. So you have great performances and you have a great screenplay. And it it looks fantastic. The editing and the pacing is perfect. So why this wouldn't win Best Picture, I don't know. But, um, you know... It's a horror movie, so it can't win. It's a genre movie. I just hear those kind of things. It doesn't matter what genre it's in. If it's a great movie, it's a yeah. great movie. I'm see Blumhouse to see them doing really well, too, because they make... T- and t- I'm very t- happy that this was a hit. They give so. uh, first-time directors a lot of breaks. So let's talk about Florida Project, Angela, because that's going to be my number two, and I know it's your number one. So uh, this is at Sean Baker. This is his uh, second film that I know of. This is a, a, a certainly a talent to really watch. There's a lot of first-time filmmakers or early filmmakers as well to watch on our list. But he is one of them that is just absolutely amazing, and the Florida Florida Project mm-hmm. was just, I recently just watched another essay and they talked about so many of the low angles just before the kids book were seeing everything from the kids' point of view. And I absolutely love that because yeah. this is like a Little Rascals um, uh, uh, film that I you know thoroughly enjoy, but there's also great aspects of what's going on, the surrounding areas. And I want to give um, a, you know a credit to Bria Venet- Venetti. Um, who plays the mother? Right, because Haley, she gets yeah. overlooked. Or Hallie or well, Haley, yeah, yeah, and she gets overlooked because Willem Dafoe is amazing. The, the, the daughter is amazing, but she is so good in this movie that uh, you know, without her, it just it just wouldn't work. Just that she's that extremely uh, believable. Pepto Bismol purple movie. first uh, movie she's ever made. that they yeah. all live in. Yeah. This is the hidden homeless. Crazy. There's so many things that, that have been conversations that come from this film. It's just an amazing film. It is yes, and you're right. It is uh, my number one film of the year, and it was my number one film as soon as I saw it. I kept yeah. waiting for something else to push it out, and nothing even came close, to be quite honest. The Florida Project is my number one film of the year. This is a perfect movie, or at least a darn near perfect, if it's not perfect, um, from this beautiful cinematography that captures kind of the goldenness of, uh, you know, that golden sun of Florida and the, the you know, and the landscapes, and like you said, the yeah. pink buildings, and um, to the, the gorgeous, per- pitch perfect performances um, from a cast that ranges from amateurs to big stars like Willem Dafoe. Oh, and it has a heart and it has all these issues built in but it's never about the issues the characters always yep. come first it's a perfect film so we'll get on to your number one yep so my number one is three billboards outside of Ebbing Missouri and as I've always said when I saw it I knew that was the best film of the year I do love grieving films Francis McDormand gives an absolutely amazing performance I think Woody Harrelson actually gets overlooked because Samuel Sam Rockwell is finally getting some credit for it which has been long overdue I think the, the dialogue in this film I think the screenplay is absolutely fantastic by Martin McDowell um, who also did in Bruges who we thought maybe was just a one-hit wonder with that in terms of what he was able to do. And so I thoroughly uh, enjoyed that. I think it's the the best film of the year. Um, we'll see if it wins the Academy Award or yeah, not. It doesn't matter. To win, but but I, we'll see. So we'll a see. lot of people are saying it's it a little controversial win. what they do. It won the BAFTA the Award. So yeah. there you go. Yeah. So, um, so w- thank you very much for watching. Go to our website, realfilmsnobs.com. As always, have a great day and great movies.